Well, good morning to you. This is a day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to the worship of God today at First Presbyterian. Just a few announcements for you before we begin our worship service. There is a uh, friendship pad there in the pew. If you take that and mark your name and pass it down so we can have a record of your attendance, but also give you a chance to meet any neighbors around you that you don't know. Uh, let me share one bit of news from our church office. Today, if you go into the hall right there um, that comes in through the side entrance, you will see the first quarter giving statements of 2024. It's amazing that the first quarter is already over. Uh, but rather than uh, mailing those initially, we're going to set those out for a couple weeks to so grab those, and then any that are left over after a few weeks will be mailed to you. So take a moment to do that today. As far as announcement goes, that, that is all I have to share with you. Make sure you read through the bulletin and see everything that's going on in the life of the church and pray to contribute to that well. In Psalm 27, David reflects on the Lord's command to him to seek his face. And David responds with the prayer, Your face, O Lord, do I seek. We have the joy today of seeking the face of the Lord. He comes to us in this time of worship, reminding us that he has made a way in Christ. But in that way now, he calls to us, he summons us to come before him and to give ourselves and to care for one another and to seek his face. And by the Spirit, we can do that. So let's pray in these next few moments that we would be faithful to that summons, just as David was to seek the face of the Lord in this worship hour ahead. Let's pray and ask the Lord to prepare us to worship. Would you stand with me and open your bulletin to page 2? Our call to worship comes from 1 Kings 8, the dedication of Solomon's temple. And now we who have the true presence of the Lord in the new temple, the temple made with living stones, even we who are his people, God dwelling with us by the Spirit, now we can say these words. So if you'd respond with the bold print. O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to him, to walk in all his ways to keep his commandments, statutes, and his rules, which he commanded our fathers. Let our hearts be wholly true to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments 
as at this day. Open your hymnals to number 167. We'll sing when morning gilds the skies. Let us go to the Lord. Father, truly, truly, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are exalted over all, and you reign from your holy temple. Your throne is in heaven, and your rule is over all creation. Your jurisdiction is without limit. Your authority is perfect and just. And yet, it is not simply our obligation to worship you. It is our joy to worship you. We delight now to dwell in your house. We delight to seek your face. We delight for you to dwell in us by your Spirit. We come that we may see you, the King, in all of your glory. And it is in the King's name, the King Lord Jesus Christ's name, that we pray as one body, one church, praying as the Lord Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Please continue standing with us as we confess our faith to one another. Our confession of faith, which can be found on page 3 of your bulletin, is taken from the Heidelberg Catechism. First Presbyterian Church, why the words and is seated at the right hand of God? Because Christ ascended to heaven to show there that he is the head of his church, the one through whom the Father rules all things. How does this glory of Christ, our head, benefit us? First, through his Holy Spirit, he pours out gifts from heaven upon us, his members. Second, by his power, he defends us and keeps us safe from all enemies. How does Christ's return to judge the living and the dead comfort you? In all distress and persecution, with uplifted head, I confidently await the very judge who has already offered himself to the judgment of God in my place and removed the whole curse from me. Christ will cast all his enemies and mine into everlasting condemnation, but will take me and all his chosen ones to himself and to the joy, joy and glory of heaven. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, often the scriptures speak about the fact that God gives us his salvation. God gives us many gifts. He gives us his joy. He gives us his very own peace. He gives us his love. But the Bible is also insistent that we not simply seek uh, the salvation of God, not that, that we not simply desire the salvation of God, but that we also desire the God of salvation. The Bible is insistent not simply that we seek the joy of God, but that we seek the God who is himself full of joy. And the Apostle Paul, uh, in our, in our uh, scripture, New Testament scripture reading this morning, will say the same thing about peace. It is wonderful to enjoy uh, the peace of God, the peace which God gives, which the world knows nothing of. But even more important than that, more important than having the peace of God is having the God of peace. Um, and so now let us go to the New Testament and we'll read from Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, and we will see the Apostle Paul beckon us to uh, desire the God of peace. Finally, my brothers, this is Paul speaking, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you all. Thus sends so far the reading of God's holy word. And so we know, all of us know, that we do not uh, seek the God of peace. We seek the God that is ourselves so often and in so many ways. And that is why the Lord in his grace invites us to, note, to, not, to not keep our sins in the dark, but to bring our sins to the light of his presence and to confess our sins to him so that we may receive his abundant forgiveness and grace in Jesus Christ. Let us go to the Lord now and confess our sins corporately and then uh, individually and silently as well. Oh, Father, who should ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall, who shall stand in your holy place? Well, the scriptures tell us that it is only he who has clean hands and a pure heart. It is only he who does not lift up his soul to what is false and who does not swear deceitfully. Only that person can ascend the hill of the Lord. He and he alone will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. But, Father, in your perfect sight, under the tribunal of your perfect law, Father, who is there among us that has clean hands? Who is there among us whose heart is completely pure? Is there even one of us who loves you with all of our 
heart, soul, mind, and strength? And who, is, there any, is there even one of us who loves our neighbor as ourselves? Is there even one of us who does not sin, who does not view himself or herself as the sort of star in the, in, in the Hollywood movie that is our own lives? Is there even one of us who looks to the interests of others with just as much determination as our own interests? Father, there is none. Father, no, there is none of us who does not uh, deserve uh, your curse and your wrath. Father, there is none. There is none who deserve a day in your courts. We in instead deserve to be cast out. We instead deserve to be cut off from you, just as we have cut others off in our efforts to establish ourselves, in our efforts to make a name for ourselves, in an effort to build up our own towers of Babel. And so, Father, we confess our sins to you. We know that we cannot ascend the hill of the Lord unless you first condescend to us. And, Father, in the fullness of time, that is precisely what you have done. You have sent your Son, born of woman, born under the law, not counting equality with you a thing to be grasped, but instead emptying himself of his glory in order to accomplish our salvation, in order to secure our redemption. We give you praise, therefore, for the Christ who descended to us so that we might ascend in Christ to you. Father, we confess our sins to you now, asking you to break the power of canceled sin for those of us who believe, and also that you would break through the hard hearts of those who do not yet believe. We confess our sins now to you silently and individually. First Presbyterian Church, the psalmist assures us of, of assur the psalmist assures us assures us of pardon, excuse me, saying that I am like a green olive, tr olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name, for it is good. Praise be to the God um, of all things. Uh, my apologies. We we uh, let us let us do our scripture reading response as well. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, and also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Let us now sing. Uh, let us now stand if you are able and sing. Uh, singing of the Psalms, Psalm 5. Open your hymn books if you're able to hymn number 51.
Please be seated. Let's go to the Lord now in our pastoral prayer. Father, reality, the real world, the world as you have made it, creation, existence itself is a prison to those who are lost. The truth is the last thing which we in ourselves wish to confront. The truth is the last person who we wish to meet. That is why it says that light has come into the world, but the people prefer darkness instead of light. But Father, we have received mercy. You have created in us new hearts. And Father, you, through your perfect patience, you have shown your mercy to us. You have shown your love for sinners by giving us new hearts. And so, Father, the truth is no longer that which imprisons us, but it is that which sets us free. The truth no longer uh, lays chains on us. It breaks chains from us. The truth is a solid ground. The truth is that solid foundation on which to build our lives. And so, Father, help us. Oh, Jesus, help us. Humble carpenter, as we build, protect us, O Lord of armies, from the evil one and his designs. Strengthen us, spirit of of adoption, as we seek to die more and more to sin and to live more and more unto righteousness. Be with our people, we pray. Father, we lift up to you again the Sullivan family and the Underwood family and everyone who uh, loved Mary. We pray for um, a memorial service that honors you and honors uh, Mary's memory as well, as well as comforts the family. We ask that this would bring great glory to your name. We also pray for Jolie Howell. Uh, we pray um, for, her, for her medical procedures that are upcoming, for the heart surgery, which is uh, coming up soon. We pray that you would protect her life, her health, and you, you would give the doctors wisdom as they uh, treat her and operate on her. We pray for peace and comfort to Jolie and Marty and their whole family. Father, we pray also to you for our country. We pray for our justice system, that your perfect holiness and that your moral law would be reflected and defended in our highest courts. We pray for our culture, that we as a people, by your grace, would would think about things that are pure and lovely and good and honorable. We pray that that the music that our culture produces and the media that our culture produces would reflect the sorts of things which Scripture calls us to think about and to meditate on. Father, help our families. Father, help us, help us, our, help our families to make wise decisions about such things as entertainment, technology, social media, and friend groups, and so on. Let us not be those who walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. Father, instead, teach each of us to meditate on your law day and night. Teach us to kiss the Son, to worship the Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit is one God forever praised. We praise you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'd like to invite uh, the people of God to continue worshiping with us as we bring our tithes and offerings to him. Oh, dear. 
Let's pray. O oh God in heaven, we give thanks for the joy of drawing near to you in worship, even this worship of giving what is ours, knowing your great promise that you draw near to us. We pray this morning, Father, that you would use these gifts to train up those young people among us. We thank you, Father, for those that teach Sunday school, for those that help with our children's ministry. We thank you for Walker and Tori and their service to our middle and high school students. We thank you for their students and their families. We pray, Father, that they would grow in the nurture and admonition of you, our God, that you would lead them in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, ladies. Good to see everybody. I want to read from God's Word, the Bible today. From Psalm 32, verse 8, God's word says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. We are very blessed people when we have good teachers, aren't we? Yeah, whether it's our parents whether it's people in church, our grandparents, teachers in school, whoever it is, good teachers are such a great blessing. Now, let me ask you this about a good teacher. I want you to think of a good teacher in your mind. When you go to a good teacher and you have a question, you don't know something and you want their help, how does a good teacher respond to you? Yeah. I'll help you. That's a great answer. Does a good teacher look at you and go, how dare you not know the answer to that question? I'm not going to help you. You better go back there and figure it out yourself. Does a good teacher do that? No. no. That's exactly what a good teacher does. A good teacher helps a good teacher understands and appreciates when you come to them for help. Do you know that God is a good teacher? God says that when we come to him with doubts, when we come to him with needs, when we are faithful to come before him with questions, God says, I will counsel you with my eye on you. God is our heavenly father who loves us. And when we go to him with things that we don't know, when we go to him with needs, God doesn't chase us away. God isn't annoyed by us. God welcomes us as his children and he helps us. I want you to listen for that in the sermon today when a, a certain man who had some doubts saw Jesus and interacted with him. Listen, listen for that love of God our Father, the good teacher in the sermon today. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are a good teacher and that you love us. When we have doubts or questions, help us to come to you knowing your great love in your son. We pray in his name. Amen. All right. Thanks, y'all. You can head back to your seats. Let's together open the words of our good teacher to John chapter 20. Continue our journey through this gospel. Coming today to the end of chapter 20, and there's only one chapter left, John 21. I encourage you, as always, to open your Bibles and to keep them open. The last thing you need to hear today is Mackie Smith's thoughts on a good life. <laughs> What we all need to hear is the Word of God, so I encourage you to keep it open in front of you, and let's pray and ask that the Lord would be faithful to bring His Word to bear on our hearts and minds. Bow your heads with me. Oh, Father in heaven, would you now make this sermon better in the ears and hearts and minds of your people than it will be proceeding from my mouth? 
Would your spirit use your word? We know that it does not return to you empty, that just like seed is scattered. So by your grace, fruit will be born. So we pray today that your spirit would yield that fruit in your people. Draw all of us to know and love you more. Lead us and help us to hear what you desire for us to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 20, our text today, verses 24 to 31. Follow along as I read God's word. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This ends the reading of God's word. May he add his blessing to it by his spirit. No doubt in many areas of the country last week, there were many frustrated by those great enemies of humanity, clouds. Because as the eclipse rolled across the nation, certainly there were some in some places. I saw some great pictures I uh, saw many who, who had a great experience of totality, uh, but there were many who were frustrated by those clouds. They missed it. They missed this great event because of the weather. Well, it turns out then when another great event happened, when Jesus visited his disciples on Resurrection Sunday, there was one who missed it. it wasn't because of clouds, but he just didn't happen to be there. That is, of course, the disciple named Thomas, good old Thomas, the man who has now gone throughout all of Christian history with a wonderful nickname, which is what? Doubting, that's right, Doubting Thomas. The Gospel of John actually gives us the most rich picture of Thomas, of all the Gospels. And I think we could come up with some other names for Thomas. One, skeptical Thomas. Here's another one. How about thoughtful Thomas? In chapter 14, it is Thomas who, when Jesus says he is going away, and they know the way to where he is going. It is Thomas who responds to Jesus and says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? I think that's a thoughtful comment. Thomas is taking seriously what Jesus is saying. It's not just going in one ear and out the other. And he's, he's trying to take Jesus' words and apply them to his life. When Jesus says he's leaving and you know the way, Thomas says, I don't know where you're going. How, how, how can I know the way to you? Thoughtful Thomas. How about this one? How about loyal Thomas? Yes, it's true. Doubtful Thomas, we think, oh, well, here's a guy who's sort of always hanging on the edges. He's not sure, very negative, probably wears a lot of dark colors. No, no, Thomas is loyal Thomas. In chapter 11, verse 16, Jesus is going back towards Jerusalem. This is on his way to 
raise Lazarus from the dead ultimately. But in the context, the Jews have just desired and attempted to kill Jesus. But Jesus says, let's go. We're going back to Jerusalem. And it is Thomas who says in this context, let us go that we may die with him. Thomas is loyal Thomas. This Thomas, this is Jesus' man willing to go with Jesus even to death. But now, Thomas is confronted with the claim that the other disciples have in fact seen the risen Jesus. And for this thoughtful Thomas, for this Loyal Thomas, this is a step too far. He responds to this claim with a statement that would not be unfamiliar today. I don't think you could easily superimpose these words on many. Many have expressed this. Many have stated this. Many have sung about this. Thomas demands objective sensory evidence of Jesus' resurrection. He demands that his eyes take in Jesus for himself. But not only that, he demands that his hands touch Jesus, feeling the wounds, leaving no gap between his personal sense experience and this claim that Jesus has risen from the dead. In Thomas's mind, this is the only way he can be assured, he can know that the same Jesus who died, the same Jesus to which he was loyal, the same Jesus that he has heard teach, this is the only way that he can be assured that this Jesus who has died is now alive again. And if we need to put an exclamation point on it, if this does not happen, Thomas says in the strongest sense that he will never believe. This is one of the great practical applications of Greek. The Greek language, we have here an emphatic negative. In Greek, they, don't, they didn't understand double negatives in the Greek. Thomas says, I will not, not believe. Now, if you have a child and they say a double negative, you look at them sarcastically and you say, so that means you're going to believe? That's not the case in Greek. A not, not is the most emphatic. It is never, it is absolutely not, unless this state of affairs is met, I will never believe that Jesus is risen. So what do we have here? This skeptical Thomas, this loyal Thomas, this thoughtful Thomas, but yet this doubting Thomas. Thomas stands in good company, I think. He stands as one of the countless multitudes who have come to a point of appreciating Jesus, appreciating him deeply, greatly, broadly, in in a real sense, And yet, he does not yet believe that Jesus is the one sent from the Father. And thus, he does not yet trust him. He does not yet exhibit a saving faith. Thomas is in good company, isn't it? wonder how many appreciate Jesus like this even defend Jesus, even defend his teaching. Yes, we might say, even express that they would defend Jesus to the point of death. This is very clear about Thomas. And again, because of the, the, the story and sort of the attitude that follows Thomas around, it's very important. Thomas is not unsure about Jesus. Thomas is quite sure about Jesus but he is not yet a Christian. He's not yet a believer. Perhaps this is touching a a place in your own heart. You've been raised to care deeply 
about the church, about Jesus' people. You wake up on Sunday morning, and if the doors are unlocked, you're going to be at church. That's a good thing. Perhaps you've been raised to defend the church. Perhaps you are a voice constantly lamenting the loss of any seemingly any shred of Christian morality in the public sphere. You are not interested in woke ideologies. You will defend Jesus' morality. You will defend Jesus' teaching. You will defend this great gift that you consider to the world of Jesus, even, you might say, to the death. But yet, perhaps, like Thomas, you have not yet arrived at saving faith. You have not yet trusted. You have not yet believed, to use Jesus' words. If so, if that's you, you're in good company. Let's look at how Thomas gets there, shall we? Let's see what takes this one who appreciates Jesus but does not yet believe in him. What moves him to a point of belief? Let's explore this text. We see very, very, uh, very purposefully in verse 26 a replay of Jesus' previous appearance. Eight days later, this is the following Sunday. You might say, Mackie, you do not know how to count. Well, in the New Testament, there's what we call inclusive dating. So the first Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, is day number one. So then Monday is day number two, etc. You get to day eight, that puts you at the next Sunday. So the next first day of the week. Again, the disciples are together in a locked room. Again, Jesus appears, issuing this glorious greeting, this common greeting, but now resounding with new meaning, peace be with you. This is Jesus again miraculously coming to his disciples, and now Thomas is there. And as Jesus does so, you can imagine maybe what Thomas's response would be because Jesus seemingly looks right to Thomas and he speaks to him directly. I want us to notice three things that Jesus does, three actions that Jesus takes. First, the first words out of Jesus's mouth, Jesus confronts Thomas's doubts. You see what he does? He he invites Thomas to come to him with the exact criteria that have lent doubt in Thomas's mind and heart. Jesus does not view Thomas in this scenario and his doubts. He does not view them as awkward. Jesus does not view them as socially unacceptable to discuss. You remember what Jesus' express purpose is in his ministry. His express purpose is for God to be glorified through him. His express purpose is that the truth of his resurrection be known. And don't you think that if that is Jesus' express purpose, that dealing with doubts would be part of that? That dealing with people who have seen Jesus but who just aren't sure, don't you think that this Jesus who has called himself to Thomas and the disciples, the way, the truth, capital T, truth, don't you think that he who is the word of God made flesh, don't you think it is part of his ministry to deal with uncertainties in the minds and hearts of those who have followed him? And this is precisely what Jesus does. He invites Thomas now to consider his doubts in light of the truth. Now that Jesus stands before him with the scars, showing himself to Thomas, he now invites Thomas to that immediately, immediate place of doubt, that, that specific point where Thomas has expressed, unless this happens. I I will never believe that Jesus is raised. Jesus confronts Thomas on precisely those grounds. 
There are, there are a number of, of crucial applications of this to us as we live following Jesus. First of all, when, when we have our own doubts, our own questions, what should we do? Should we be embarrassed? Should we hide? Should we say things like, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be doubting that. I shouldn't have those questions. Should we just bottle it up? No. No, let us go to him. Go to Jesus in prayer. Go to him and consider his word. I heard a, a podcast not too long ago where the hosts were interviewing a number of Christians at, at a big um, Christian conference. And the, the, pod, the host was asking them, how can you say that, that Christianity is the only way to faith? Now, these are Christians. These are, these are people who are going to say, yes, there's only one way to God, and it is Jesus Christ. And the host is saying, this is a Christian host, this isn't, so this isn't aggressive. But the host is saying, how, how can you state, how can you say with confidence that Jesus is the only way to salvation? And, and in what was really a disappointing uh, consensus, many of these Christians could really only come up with one answer. They said, well, I can't judge anybody else. All I can say is that Christianity feels right to me. That's all I can say. And the host responded and said, well, I've met a number of Mormons. I've met a number of Muslims. I've met a number of others who says, well, uh, Mormonism feels right to me. Muslim says, well, my faith feels right to me. How, how can you respond to that? I, I just, I hope you see that, that on a playing field like that, the chasm of doubt that could be caused to any number of Christians or any number of those who, who claim Christ who have not felt a certain way, who, who have an expectation that they have this this sort of burning or this emotional experience within them, and that is what their hope in Christ rests upon. If they have not experienced that, what doubts must exist? Maybe this is you. You've seen other Christians, and, and they just seem to be so sure of everything. They seem to come together with God's people and, and just be overtaken by these emotions. Maybe you, you remember in your younger days going to youth conferences, and there was there was music, and there was lights, and there was this, this almost ecstatic experience of people having emotions and crying and feeling all sorts of different things. And you, to this day, look back on that, and you think, I, that, I've never had that. That's never happened to me. See what sorts of doubts might come when that is expected. What is the right step now for you? Christian, it's, it's not to hide that away. It's not to feel ashamed. It's not to think that you need to go sit in the back row of the Christian room and let all the real Christians up front have all the big experiences. No, it is to go to Jesus. What do I mean by that? I, I don't mean that generally. I mean go to his word that he has given Go to him in prayer. Go to him and see in that particular instance that perhaps resting an entire faith on one emotional experience, that's not the assurance that the Bible gives to God's people. That's not something we should be expecting. Go to God's word to see what proofs we should be looking for. What has Jesus just said to his disciples, what proof, what, what, what should we rest our faith in Jesus on but the historical reality of his death and resurrection? By the way, that's what the podcast went on to be about. We're not people who rest in our own subjective experiences. We look to what really happened, to what Jesus really did, to his resurrection, to his ascension, 
that God has given to us as part of our assurance of faith. But when these doubts arise, we are not to simply sit back on them and think we need to hide them and cover ourselves in a blanket. We're to go to Christ, to pray to him, to seek his word. Another application, when doubts come, we need not fear them. Parents, grandparents, when your kids come to you and say, this doesn't make sense, here's your, here's your, exo- here's your exhortation from the pulpit today, don't freak out. <laughs> when, you're, when your kids come to you and say, you know, I, it just doesn't seem to be making sense, I'm not putting all these pieces together, you see nowhere in God's word are we told that Christian faith is threatened by asking good questions. The, the, the late Tim Keller has written that doubt can be compared to a pathogen that causes an immune response in the blood. Now, it's important. Doubt is something we seek to overcome. We need to be careful. Doubt is not in and of itself a good thing, doubt of Jesus. However, in God's sovereign hands... God can use our doubts to sharpen our minds, to increase our faith, as long as, just as we see here, as long as those doubts are brought to Jesus, as long as they are humbly submitted to his word. Again, not not ignored, not avoided. Again, parents and grandparents, here's, here's what your job is. Loving your children, loving your grandchildren to guide them with joy and wisdom and grace to this Jesus who is risen. Again, not just, that's not just a general religious statement to, to bring them to him in prayer, to bring them to him in his word, to ensure, yes, probably we'll take a Sunday morning here or there where a young person does not want to get up and come to church and it's your job to say, well, We need to come before the living Christ. Not because you should be ashamed, but because you need to grow, just like I need to grow. And here's final application from Jesus' addressing Thomas' doubts. I, I want you to hear, this is a little bit of Mackie Smith talking, your pastor desperately desires you to bring your doubts to him, to bring your questions, so do your elders, so does Myers, so do those who love you. Don't, don't, don't be ashamed. If you are willing to examine those doubts in light of the truth of the risen Christ, bring them. God, God is greater than your doubts. First John, our hearts condemn us. God is greater than our hearts. God is greater than our concerns. God is greater than your worries. God is greater than all of those things. See what Jesus does with those who doubt in him and yet are around his people and yet are faithful to be there. Christ shows up. Christ welcomes those doubts and addresses them and confronts them. Secondly, and and these last two will be far, far more brief, When we do come before Jesus with our doubts, we find continually what we see Jesus do next with Thomas. He engages him on the grounds by which he comes to Jesus on his doubts, and then he says this remarkable sentence, do not disbelieve but believe, the end of verse 27. This is to see, secondly, that Jesus calls for faith. Having met the doubts of Thomas, Jesus then summons Thomas to believe. There are echoes here of Jesus' question to his disciples during his ministry, who do you say that I am? And you see, this this is the fundamental question that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection issues to your heart. If Jesus has been raised, then do you trust him? Do you believe that he is God sent from the Father? This is the verdict 
to which God's word calls you today and each day. Not will you go and and be a political force for morality. Not will you defend a certain lifestyle. All of these things may flow out and do perhaps in, in many ways flow out of faith. But this is the fundamental verdict to which Jesus summons you as you come to him. Do you believe? Do you trust in him? Do you acknowledge that he is the one he says he is? Do you assent to his righteousness and glory? And do you then trust in him such that your life becomes a desire and a track of of obeying him, of seeking him with all your heart? Jesus calls for faith. And finally, we see for Thomas, this question hits the mark. The third thing that Jesus does is he works faith in Thomas's heart, evidenced in verse 28 by Thomas's glorious, magnificent, simple, beautiful profession, my Lord and my God. This is one of the the, the simplest yet most profound statements of Jesus's deity and lordship in all of the Bible. By calling Jesus Lord and God, Thomas is agreeing with the exact thing that John introduced in the very first chapter of his gospel. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. God himself The second person of the Trinity took on flesh in Jesus Christ. In his confession, Thomas is agreeing with that statement that Jesus is, as he has said, one with the Father. He is acknowledging that Jesus has told the truth. And not only does Thomas say, Jesus, you are Lord and God. He says, my Lord. And my God, speaking to Jesus, not only is there agreement with Jesus, but there is trust in Jesus. There is submission to his lordship. This is saving faith. Thomas has brought his loyalty to Jesus. He has brought his thoughtfulness to Jesus. He has followed Jesus, but now Thomas worships Jesus. Why do we, why is it so critical for faith to be evidenced in the worship of God? Because it is an expression, and in biblical reasoning, this is how our agreement with Christ is expressed. This is how our submission to Christ is expressed. We bring ourselves before Him as a living sacrifice. Thomas shows that he now believes by his worship before Christ, this that Jesus has worked in his heart. So you see, Thomas has moved. God, all of of the work in Thomas's life, God now brings to flower. He has moved from one loyal to one who worships. Let's conclude with this. here's Here's a perspective you may be sitting there thinking, well, you know, boy, this is all great. But, but Thomas, doubting Thomas, I don't know if you missed this, preacher. <laughs> Thomas has the exact evidence for which he has asked. Did you notice that? And so Thomas, just like any rational person, having received the evidence for which he longs, of course he's going to believe. You may sense then in this story sort of a disconnect. Of course, doubting Thomas is going to believe when he gets what he asks for. I have been asking God for this evidence, for this favor, for this reality to come into my life, but none of it has happened. Thomas has gotten what he wanted. I haven't. So where in the world, how in the world should this apply to me? Indeed, Thomas has seen and believed. But do you see what Jesus said in verse 29? Yes, 
there is a great blessing to those like Thomas who saw the risen Jesus and believed. But then Jesus gives a beatitude. He says, there is a blessing, a blessedness. The same blessing, in fact, of those who see and believe that may be known by those who do not see and yet believe. How could this be? If you, are, or if you are doubtful, you may wonder, as you are surrounded by all here, none of us have seen the risen Christ with our eyes. So how could it be that God has brought this blessing of faith for those who have not seen and yet believed? Well, we must remember here as we approach the answer to this question, the fundamental claim of all the Bible that faith is a gift from God. That's critical. God, God has used all that Thomas has seen and heard to work faith. God, God, God has not been absent from Thomas's life until this, this very point. I hope that gives you hope for people you may know and love who do not yet know Christ. God has not been absent from Thomas's life. He has been working in what Thomas has seen and heard. And, and yes, this faith shows itself. It is the gift of God, but it shows itself as a true choice, as a decision, as a commitment. Thomas gives himself to Christ. But you understand that his faith does not ultimately originate in his, Thomas's intellectual assent. The origin of faith is from above. John chapter 6, verse 65, no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Hebrews chapter 12 describes Jesus as the founder of our faith. What's happening with Thomas is that Jesus is bringing this faith to flower by his sovereign grace. And so when we think, well, well, how can people who have not seen yet believe? We must understand that it is still today God that does this heart work. How does he do it? Well, might I point you to the last two verses of our text. John expresses that his purpose is writing this gospel is to set before you evidence that you might believe in Jesus as your Lord and your God. And that by believing, by this saving faith, you might have life in his name. How does God call those who have not seen to believe? He does so primarily by his word. Remember, what do we have here sitting before us? We have the results of the Holy Spirit's work guiding this apostle to write these words such that we have before us in all of Scripture the sufficient words for you to know Jesus Christ as Lord and God. Now certainly, and, and this is not, not bad to pursue, certainly there's plenty of evidence kind of in the secular sense, historically, etc. But there is no greater evidence than this if you're wondering, okay, I haven't seen Jesus, why should I believe? Because God's inspired, inerrant, and holy word is setting Jesus before you right now. That's why. This is what God uses to bring about what Peter describes in 1 Peter chapter 1. Listen to these words. Speaking to Christians, Peter writes, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. God uses this inspired testimony by his Spirit to declare to you that Jesus is risen and call you to the verdict of faith. I wonder if you read uh, verse 30 
I've had this reaction. You read verse 30, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in his book. And you might go, ooh, that, just imagine that. If, if, if only I could know what those are. That's the evidence that I need. There are all sorts of, uh, uh, of what we call apocryphal gospels out there. People who have tried to sort of fill in these blanks. Okay, let's give you just a little bit more of what Jesus did. Maybe that'll convince you. You may think, hidden in that statement, I despair because that's the very evidence that I need. But let me paraphrase a guy named Leon Morris, his spectacular comment on this, this verse. If, if someone is dead, you want to get your hands on every story you can find about them. Because for a dead person, that's all there is. What did they do? Past tense. What did they write? What did they say? What did they accomplish? If you, if you are wanting to try to learn about a dead person, you want to find all about them that you can. But don't you see the Apostle John is not memorializing one that is dead. He is introducing you to someone who is alive. He is showing you in these words, supplemented and supported by all of God's inspired Scripture, He is showing you Jesus who lives. He is calling you to give of yourself in faith, to believe, and indeed, as God's Word says, if you seek Him with your heart, you will find Him. So, what could we finish with but these words of Jesus? Do not disbelieve, but believe and have life in his name. Let's pray. Oh, Father, press upon us your grace, your welcome in Christ, and press upon us the joy of being able to come before you as your children, those who are so often weighed down with doubts and anxieties and uncertainties. Impress upon us the grace, but also impress upon us your summons to come to you, to bring our need to you. Not to let go and let God, but to pray to God and get going. To bring our needs before you. To be faithful to worship, knowing that you will meet us, that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. We rejoice in that good news. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing in response to God's word, number 705 in your hymnal. Let's stand together and sing, I know whom I have believed.
And now because Christ is risen, go with his blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.